Hey soldiers, the economy continues to slow. We're going to show you empirically how that's happening in several sectors. Now, Janet Yellen, who's the Treasury Secretary, along with President Biden and uh, several other high-ranking members of the administration, continue to insist that the economy is doing just fine. And maybe they're referring to their own economy. Lord knows they certainly don't have to uh, you know, stop by a gas station several times a week. They're driven around. They have somebody to do that. They don't experience that. This is fine. I'm okay with the events that are unfolding currently. So unless you experience it, getting a readout on a piece of paper, someone might say, oh, look, gas prices are down three cents a gallon. Uh, and that might be something that they come to the podium and actually crow about. In reality, we actually experience it, right? So we know that, yeah, while gas prices may have moderated a bit from the hikes, uh, from the, you know, spikes, rather, food prices are out of this world expensive. This is getting out of hand. All right. So let's get into this. Let's talk about several sectors of the economy and what's actually happening. Let's start with shipping. Shipping covers two very important aspects of the economy. Number one is, of course, uh, the it's a barometer for demand, okay? Of course, the more shipped, the higher the demand. You go by, it, let's, let's create a new index here. Let's call it the Soldiers of Finance Front Porch Amazon Box Index. We'll clean it up, shorten it up later. Uh, if you drive past any main street in America, if you see a lot of Amazon boxes, then I guess you understand that the economy is probably doing rather okay. That's one indication uh, because people are ordering things. There's demand for stuff. But if those boxes start to, you know, maybe they go from five boxes a week on the porch to, oh, now maybe it's three. Um, now maybe you see two boxes, you know, every week or so. Uh, then, okay, we got a problem. We have an indication of a slowdown. So there, on the one hand, the FedExes of the world are involved in the shipping piece of it, uh, and they're going to demonstrate that, but they're also exposed to these gasoline prices, these diesel prices. They're in the transportation industry. We talked about the four sectors of the information infrastructure, communications, transportation, power, you know, electricity, oil, all this stuff that makes the world go, and commerce. You take any one of them out of the equation, the rest fall like dominoes. So FedEx warned of weakening global shipping demand in a preliminary earnings report last week. Now, this was, the report is no longer preliminary. They've issued it. They've left the market scrambling to determine whether the problems reflect internal company shortcomings or a broader economic diagnosis. Now, we have our answer because this was published on September 21st. And then, let me see here. It was uh, updated. Yeah, it was 21st. So then uh, Amazon came out on the 23rd. And they actually followed up on this. Amazon is making significant adjustments it apparently was overly optimistic about its need to grow its supply chain so rapidly at the height of the pandemic. Joseph Schweiderman, the Chicago-based Institute's director, said. Now, he's, uh, he's a uh, director over at the DePaul University's Chatham Institute for Metropolitan Development. And he found that Amazon's air freight fleet averaged about 194 flights Per week earlier this month, up 3.8% from March. Their data showed the smallest increase in flight growth compiled every six months since May of 2020. So even though it, it did go up, it is slowing. Amazon's air freight is slowing. Now, my brother actually drives for Amazon, okay? So... I don't have any late breaking news from him. Uh, I actually, I do. He's been telling me that uh, his routes have been easier than normal. Okay, because usually he drives up uh, into 
that he's here in Maryland, but he drives up into, you know, the Boston area uh, every night. And when he does that, he's waiting around to receive different packages put on his uh, tractor trailer. Okay, it's that much stuff. But now he's saying he's been more local. Okay, so I don't know if that's a function of just them changing up his routes in particular. I, I will ask him and get back to you. But um, Amazon Air is experiencing a slowdown. So that confirms what FedEx has seen. So consumer demand is definitely starting well, it has slowed. We saw the two quarters, consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. That was real. What, whatever they want to call that, okay, we'll call it a recession because we exist in the real world. Uh, but whatever the rest of these bureaucrats want to call it just to try to win an election that they're going to lose anyway, uh, they can't deny that we did have two consecutive quarters of negative growth. We will see what happens uh, with the um, third one, whether or not it will be negative or positive. I believe it's got to be negative. And here's the reason why I'm saying that is because you've got price pressure on necessities. OK, food prices are soaring and uh, CNN, CNN is saying that's changed how we eat. Of course it has. You think about the average retiree. OK, someone on a fixed income, someone who did what they were supposed to do with their money. So they saved up. OK, they uh boosted their 401k, they uh, put their money in the IRA, they did all those things. Uh, and now we're looking at a situation where they're going to the supermarket. Well, first of all, the principal that they have working for them to give them an income in retirement, uh, it's a lot less than, you know, it was before the President Biden took office. Let's just be real. Okay, let's talk about who Wall Street is. We'll get back to the food piece in a minute because it's vital. But let's talk about who Wall Street is when they say Wall Street lost, okay? When they say Wall Street lost, they're talking about anybody with a 401k, 403b, traditional, or Roth, IRA, HSA, or pension. Any of those things, any combination of those things that you have, that means you're Wall Street, okay? Uh, that means that People who are your next door neighbor, of course, uh, folk who have worked for 30 or 40 years putting away money, they are Wall Street. So when this occurs, people people in the news media like to refer to Wall Street as this big conglomerate of fat cats. In reality, it also includes the average American. Shall we ride? So when we talk about this crisis that we're seeing uh, with food, you got to understand that the principle of these people's retirement has shrank, thereby kicking out less income in an environment where prices and interest rates are increasing. We've also got these layoffs that are coming. We'll get to that in a minute. Now, if you are someone who is retired, it's going to be pretty difficult for you to go out and find a job in an environment where layoffs are becoming more and more prominent. Lisa Altman used to take pride in being able to eat what she wanted without worrying much about the cost. When she was growing up, seconds weren't served and side dishes were rare. My mom had a budget every week and she stuck to it. She said, my mother too. Uh, for a time, uh, we were doing bad, man. But I tell you, my mother, God rest her soul, she always, it's a funny story, there was a shopping mall. If you are from the Maryland area, you know about Mondawmin Mall. And uh, we always, oh man, we would go up there with her to do food shopping. And you would smell the different smells from, uh, they had all kinds of fast food places and it smelled so good. And we would beg her to be able to get some of this greasy, sugary, salty fast food. And she would say, no, because I am cooking, I'm buying food that I'm going to cook and we're going to stretch it out. Okay. Um, and that fast food's going to last. It's not even going to keep well. It's not even going to make good, uh, leftovers. And so she was diligent and disciplined about buying nutritious food for us that she would cook. Okay. And my mother is gone. She died, uh, earlier this year and my brother and I were talking and we were saying, Oh, what we wouldn't give for some of her French fries. She would cut the potatoes and fry it. And I don't know how to do it to make it taste like that. 
part of the taste, part of the recipe was nostalgia. And we no longer have anything but the memory. Uh, this young lady is saying it was humbling to have to go from a situation where she had abundance to, uh, in terms of her food, to uh, a situation where she is right now. Um, Altman and her wife live in Austin, Texas with three children. Recently, they've been relying mostly on one income. Their reduced earnings coupled with inflation have dealt a blow to their finances. Absolutely. Uh, this is tragic. More and more Americans are seeing this. Food prices have spiked 11.4% over the past year, the largest annual increase since May of 1979, according to data released in mid-September by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Grocery prices jumped 13.5% and restaurant menu prices increased 8% in that period. My wife wanted to go out and go to a fancy restaurant. I like taking my wife out to nice places, but I'm not going to lie to you. I don't do it often. Uh, and her and I, we sat down and said, well, do we really want to go here? Or do we just want to get some takeout? Because if we go to that restaurant, we're going to be subject to higher prices to begin with. And then we're going to have to pay 20% because they've got good service. And we were going for dinner. So we'd pay at least 20% for a tip. So we'd do 20% higher. And my wife likes to have a drink. I'm a designated driver. She likes to have a drink or two. And guess what? In Maryland, you got a 6% uh, additional alcohol tax. Okay. So we added it up, man. And we said, you know what? Mm -mm, mm -mm, we can't do it. We're going to go and get takeout, enjoy a movie at home. Okay. People are being forced to do things like that because we want to, you know, be able to be fulfilled, but also... We want to be able to have money to invest uh, and continue to do that. And a lot of people are finding that impossible right now because of what's going on in food. Do you know that uh, their uh, Grubhub and uh, what's the other one? DoorDash, they're offering buy now, pay later arrangements for food. That's where we are. Iceland Grocery over in the UK, they have a loan system set up. For groceries, okay? This is where we're at. Consumers are responding by looking for deals and switching to generic brands, according to July data from the market research firm IRI. Companies like Tyson have noticed customers are switching from beef to chicken, and Applebee's and IHOP have reported an uptick in higher income customers who are likely trading down from pricier restaurants. Some people may be dining out less often. That's us, okay? for sure. And we're also, as a combination, avoiding the restaurants altogether. Um, we're, another thing we're doing, let me tell you what we did. We like sandwiches because we're, we're all, my wife is out. She has her office on the property and she's out there, um, you know, in here, in my office doing my thing. And we like to get a sandwich because sandwiches are quick. Okay. You just you fix it. Good to go. She takes it back in her office. I, I'm enjoying my sandwich here. Lunch meat is crazy expensive. You know what I did? I went and I bought a ham, okay, like a ham shoulder for um, $13. And I bought a turkey breast for $10 and some bread and some mayonnaise. And we got mustard and all that, lettuce, tomato. And we just cooked that and sliced it up and bam, sandwich. It's actually better because we get more for less. So that's one way that we've been improvising in terms of food. If food prices continue to increase at a rate that outpaces increases in wages, which it has been doing, that is the inevitable consequence. That consequence being that uh, people are going to realize food insecurity. They're going to go hungry. Okay. There, we, we did a video a while back about people skipping meals. Okay. Parents skipping meals so the kids could eat. Uh, things like that. It's getting tough out there, y'all. November's coming up. I can't look. I don't feel sorry for you if you put people back in office who have created this type of situation. Oh, son of a bitch. That's as political as I'll get. Now, the last thing. So we got dropping demand for uh, all of these superfluous goods. FedEx and Amazon are slowing down in terms of their shipping. Okay, so we got dropping demand. We got higher food prices. And here is the 
coup de gras, or if you are from West Baltimore, the coup de grace. With 64% increase in electric bills expected this winter, here's what Massachusetts is doing to explore relief. Yes, you heard that right. I ain't talking about Germany. I'm not talking about the UK. Yes, it would, they'll be lucky if they can get access to energy to heat their homes, period, okay? We'll be lucky if we can continue to pay for the service throughout the year. As I said before, you got to lock in these rates. You got to do it. Um, because as these politicians get more zealous in this green fantasy, uh, we're going to see uh, strictures and restrictions on energy uh, supply. Okay, demand will still be the same, but supply will be the question. As base staters prepare for steep rate hikes in their electric bills this winter, Massachusetts Attorney General Mara Healy said relief may be on the way. Now, let me guess what this relief may be. It's going to be some sort of state aid, okay? They're going to make it look like the state is just going to come to your rescue magically with a pot of money. Healy's office convened utility companies as well as state administrators and regulators on Wednesday, the same day National Grid announced skyrocketing national, uh, natural gas prices linked to the war in Ukraine. I guess this is Putin's natural gas hike now, right? It's going to trigger 64% increase in monthly residential bills starting this November. Okay, it's coming up. Customers can expect a 293 monthly bill for 2022 to 2023 winter season. We're just talking natural gas. Compared to 179 on average last year, National Grid said in the news release. Quote, this is devastating. Devastating for residents. Devastating for many in our small businesses. Okay, small businesses. Let's talk about that. If it costs more for them to pipe in that natural gas, then they're going to have to pass that on to you. No matter what that business is. Say it's one of those restaurants we were talking about. Menu prices are going to have to go up. Healy, the Democratic nominee for governor, told reporters Thursday afternoon in Boston as she toured uh, the Verizon Innovation Center. She was just saying, it's devastating. It's devastating, of course. In an interim solution, Healy urged Bay Staters to contact their utility companies about creating payment plans. They're going to have to do that, okay? Um, now, I know for the longest time, and we had experience with this, and uh, when I was growing up, Baltimore Gas and Electric would not cut you off if it was winter. I do not know if they still do that. I know one winter, our furnace went out in this house that my mom was uh, renting. Our furnace went out, and um, we had to run the oven in the morning. And you would be surprised how cold a house gets uh, in the winter. It was just, sometimes, honestly, it was colder outside, uh, it was colder in the house in the morning than it was outside because there was, you know, the shades were drawn and everything. It was, it was much colder. Speaking in her attorney general capacity, Healy signaled the Commonwealth could also follow the example set by New Hampshire, where lawmakers expanded eligibility for a fuel assistance program through a mixture of federal and state funds. See, what did I tell you? Massachusetts officials should consider that approach, Healy said. That's going to raise your taxes. Okay, this money is not just falling out of the sky. So, yeah, she'll give you a break on your electricity bills by putting money into your right pocket, but then she's going to take it out of your left in higher taxes. The dramatic price jump underscores uh, Massachusetts' transition away from natural gas. So they're taking away a, a method to uh, fuel their uh, power structure up there, and the demand is still there. Another thing that my office is encouraging is a look at how we actually procure and, pro and purchase energy, energy, Healy said. I think we could, as a state, change the way some of that is procured or purchased. That would help smooth out some of the volatility and sticker shock. According to the Institute for Energy Research, Massachusetts gets about 50% of its electricity from natural gas. So transitioning away from that to what? The next highest... Uh, source would be coal. You know they're trying to get away from that. After that, it's nuclear. It takes about 20 years, I think, to build a nuclear power plant. So I just don't understand uh, what they're talking about when they're talking about transitioning away from natural gas. Uh, what else is there? Okay, as of 2021, 
Uh, Massachusetts was still getting a large amount of its electricity from natural gas uh, and coal. So I'm not sure what they're transitioning to. Um, she doesn't say. Uh, of course, there's only one thing that could be she could be talking about is wind and solar. And again, you're not going to power that uh, state on wind and solar to the tune that you are coal, nuclear, and natural gas. It's a pipe dream right now. The technology just isn't there. And I want to say this. Look, there's no bigger environmentalist than me. I'm, we're on well water out here, okay? Uh, septic tank, the whole nine yards. I don't want to see a piece of plastic within 100 miles of me because we grow stuff on this property, all right? So we're very fastidious about the uh, our environmental impact. But I'm also a realist, all right? And I know that there are several impediments to solar and wind. Now, that might be great for a hyper-localized uh, area, like if I want to run uh, an outbuilding on it, okay, then that might be a great uh, alternative. Uh, or if I want to want to run a portion of my house power off of it, a great alternative. But when we're talking about powering industry, okay, when we're talking about uh, setting up the type of capacity that's going to enable a grid to keep people from freezing to death in Boston in the middle of winter, Come on, man. Solar and wind ain't it. All right, guys. So that's uh, the report for today. It's been a long one. I know. Hey, guys, check out our first live. We did a live and we're going to do a lot more. Check it out right here. Talking about the terrible secret they can't hide anymore. That secret is they don't know what the hell they're talking about. Find out who I'm talking about by watching this video. Guys, I will talk to you soon.